Okay, so welcome good. back everyone to um, session three, the first turtle session of the conference. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Jackie Litzkis. I'm the chair of this session um, and I'm excited to chair the session full of turtle talks. The first presentation, la première présentation dans cette uh, session, is that pretty good, Greg? <laughs> Et par Greg Bulte, and he's going to be talking about choosing a mate when everyone's watching. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Greg Bulte, I'm from Carleton University, and uh, the work I'm going to be presenting today uh, is work that I've done with a honor student, Brooke Huno at uh, Carleton, and as well with uh, Gabe Blue and Mass at the University of Ottawa. And uh, where I'm sitting right now, as well as where we've done that work, is uh, in Lake Apinicon on, uh, in um, uh, eastern Ontario. And this is a traditional land of the Algonquin and um, the Mississauga people. So uh, this, this is where we've been doing our work. So I'm going to start not by uh, talking about turtles, but by talking about 80s rom-com. Uh, so for those of you who are probably above uh, 40 would maybe remember a, a movie called When Harry Met Sally, in which there is a classic scene, uh, which I'm not going to describe in details, but in which um, the character of Sally, played by Meg Ryan, um, creates a scene, let's call it that, in a, in a diner. And that attracts the attention of a lot of people around. And I'm partly interested in this woman right there. Because this woman uh, witnessed that interaction between uh, Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal and uh, used the information that she's seen to make a decision. Because after witnessing this scene, she told the waiter uh, that she wants the same thing as Meg Ryan for her lunch. Now, you can watch the scene to know what, what this is about. But the point is uh, that this, this woman here used public information to make a behavioral decision. In, in this case, she made a, a foraging decision based on information that was not directed to her, but uh, that information that she uh, witnessed. So basically as a bystander. Well, as it turns out, public information is pretty uh, important in, in animal behavior. And, and this is a field that's been um, growing in the last uh, maybe 20 years. Uh, and it's been shown that there's, it plays an important role in mate choice. So both male and females will pay attention to what other, whether they're specific are doing and, and what they're doing will affect their mate choice decision. And in fact, it's you know, widespread enough, that there's been two meta-analysis published in the last couple of years on this topic. And they show that it's both taxonomically widespread and that it seems to play an important role in, uh, in mate choice decision. So uh, given the prevalence of this uh, type of information in mate choice, we thought that maybe it's, it's also occurring in mapped turtles. And, and the reason I was specifically wondering about mapped turtles, not only because I spent way too much time staring at them, but um, it, it's mostly because in terms of, of uh, behavior, this is a very gregarious species. And they do mate when they're aggregated at their hibernation site. So when, when map turtles mate, there's hundreds of individuals in one spot. And so there's a lot of potentials for, you know, male and male, a male and a female that are interacting uh, together to be seen by a bystander, either another male and female, and, and influencing their, uh, their decision about mate. This is an example of a female with two males uh, that are right next to her. And this is a pretty common occurrence when, you, uh, when, uh, when they're aggregated at the hibernation site. Now, um, another reason why it, it could be important in map turtles is because of um, sperm competition. So we know that there's a lot of sperm competition going on in mate turtles. So that could play a role into the, um, the, the use of public information. So we ask a very, very simple question here is that does the presence of rivals to other males will influence the reproductive uh, behavior of males. So for instance, if we have the focal female here that's being courted by this male, well, it could be witnessed by a third party male and that male may make a decision regarding its, whether or not it's gonna court or approach, approach that female based on how that interaction plays out. And I already mentioned, I forgot to add my slide. <laughs> I'll mention that there's a lot of uh, sperm competition in, uh, in map turtles. 
And we know that, at, at least in mapped turtles, we know in this population that um, about 75% of clutches are sired by two or three males. So that indicates that, that females will mate with multiple males and there, there's a lot of sperm competition. And we know that in some species such as zebra finch and um, uh, mollies, molly fish, their uh, males will actually avoid females that are affiliated with rivals. And, and the argument here is that they do that to avoid spur competition. So if they know a female likely mated with another male, they might choose another female in which the risk of sperm competition is low, presumably lower. So we, uh, we wanted to see if that was the case in northern map turtles. So we tried to answer this question in the field using uh, 3D printed decoys if we use in previous experiments. But this time we put males uh, in, uh, along with females to see the response of, of free ranging males. So we, we conducted a very simple experiment. We made um, 3D printed females and males and we deployed them in two treatments. Uh, one was a female that was surrounded by three males and the other was a female not surrounded by any males that we call rivals. And we repeated that with, uh, so we had in total four stations, a, one with each treatment that we deployed every day for 10 days and they recorded videos for eight hours a day. So you can do the math. So there's a lot of videos to go through. Um, and this is what it looks like in reality. Uh, at the end of this, at the, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll put a little video as well uh, in the chat. So this is uh, what the two treatments looked in the field. So we predicted that females affiliated with, with rivals um, should be less visited by males. So you know, we expected that there would be fewer males hanging out around the females that had decoys. And so we counted the number of male visits each females received, each fake females received, and also looked at the duration of those visits. We also predicted that males should interact less with, uh, with the female decoys that are affiliated with rivals. And we, we looked at three types of interactions. We looked at investigation. So males that would just uh, be at least a body length from the decoys and stretch their neck toward it. So that was sort of our definition of an investigation. We looked at the ones that mounted the decoy. So they just at least put two limbs on it and the ones that actually tried mating with it, which happened also. Uh, and, and again, we predicted that if, if a female was with males, it, it, she should receive fewer of these interactions. And finally, we also look at where the in investigation were directed on the decoys, whether they were directed at, directed the head, the tail, or the side, because um, again, we don't have any directional predictions here, but we thought that that might differ uh, between the two types of um, treatments. So just again, to give you an example, so we have uh, two real males interacting with our decoys here, one in investigating the posterior end of the turtle, the other one is trying to mate with it. And this is a male that would be mounting the decoy without actually trying to mate with it. So, so our results were, were kind of interesting. First of all, the, uh, the first results we got uh, was contrary to our expectations. So we found that females without rivals uh, received, um, yeah, so she, sorry, is the other way around. My statement is incorrect here. Females with rivals, received more visits than females without. So basically it seems like if, if females are with males, they attract more males. So that was contrary to our expectation. In fact, about 20% more uh, visits than the females that were affiliated with males. But then we, we start looking at the numbers. We noticed that the, uh, the males that visited actually ended up interacting more frequently when rivals were absent. So although the females with males attracted more real males, when the males were absent, the visiting males ended up interacting more with the turtles. And not only that, they interacted them where they interact, interacted with the turtles differently. Uh, and the biggest difference was, was in the number of males that made uh, what we could call nosing of the tail of the female decoy. So males approaching the cloaca of the fake female, the cloacal area of the fake female. And so there was a huge difference, uh, which is in the top of the graph here between the two treatments. And, and uh, interestingly, this is a behavior that is uh, often interpreted as a way that males assess the receptivity of a female. So we think that maybe when males are, uh, when there's nobody who's watching, the females will actually try to interact more 
with, uh, with a female than when there's other males around. And we also found a trend fall that followed our, our prediction that the females not affiliated with males will also have more mounting and mating attempts, which was the case, but the sample size here was relatively low and I forgot to, to put, well, you can see on the y-axis the, the numbers, um, but the difference was not statistically significant in this case, but the trends was really in the direction we're predicting. So how do we piece that together? What, what's, what do we think is actually going on here? Well, um, we think that males might cue on rivals to actually locate receptive females. So that might be just a, a quick way for males to identify females that are potentially receptive when they're navigating the, the landscape. If they see other males around a female, it might be something worth investigating. However, um, when there are rivals around, they are, they're less likely to inter interact with, uh, with those females. And they also interact differently with them. So it seems like there's maybe something, a combination of, of um, att being attracted to your same sex individuals to locate females. But once you come closer, then what the other males are doing come, come becomes important and, and affects their response to that particular female. So uh, obviously there's a lot of things uh, that are left to, to, um, um, to study here. Uh, I'm really, for instance, in, interested in, in why our males are actually attracted by each other. So for instance, if we remove the females, will they, will they be attracted by each other? And, um, and also how females are responding as well, which we currently can't test with our models. So uh, with all that, I would like to acknowledge a, a few people that were really helpful in getting this work done. So uh, Steve Lougheed at the Queen's University Biological Station, who's been um, a huge supporter of the, the turtle work we've been doing there, and a few other people, Ed, Stephanie, um, Jeff, as well as uh, Ryan, who really helped making those fake turtles. And of course, uh, my institution, Carlton, and uh, the Queen's University Biosculpt Station for helping me along. All right, so that's uh, what I had to say about the turtles. All right, any questions for Greg? Go ahead, Nick. Excellent talk as usual, Greg. Um, so when they're nosing the cloaca, how important do you think chemical cues are in this to, be, to present a normal behavior? So, so, so say that again, sorry? Well, you, you're say, you were saying how um, most often before mating, there's, there's, uh, they're nosing the female's cloaca or, or yeah. approaching from posterior. Um, how critical do you think chemical cues are? And you think if you had a chemical cue involved in that, would would your would your numbers be different? I think it must. I, I I'm convinced it's important. Um, however, what one thing we did find is, and, and I think you were part of, at the station. We're trying to play with that. Is it doesn't seem like we can really attract males to female scent in the field, which we, we can do with other species. So um, in map turtles, but I think at close range, it probably plays a role. Uh, I, I I would bet money on that, but um, I, I don't know to which extent and I have certainly no idea what kind of chemicals are involved. Um, yeah. That's very cool. You need, you need some new like multi, uh, multi uh, feature models. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like your, robotic. Add, to, add yes. to your model you know, budget. Can, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could be done, like, but yeah. Yeah, oh, it's so cool. Every time, such cool stuff. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Scott. I see your hand is raised. Great. Yeah, I was uh, just curious if, uh, and I may have missed this if you did mention it, but did were, were there any other turtles that uh, in the area that interacted with the models? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, <laughs> we didn't see there are, uh, there's actually quite a lot of stink bots that hang out in that area. We see them snorkeling and, and they're certainly painted turtles and map turtles in the lake. Uh, I, I yet, I haven't seen yet uh, another, maybe a couple of painted turtles swimming by, uh, but definitely not interacting. We had loons and otters interacting with them, uh, but, but uh, not, not, uh, not any other species of turtles, which yeah, would be interesting to see if 
painted turtles can be fooled like seeing oh we big female <laughs> yeah and, and that's why i asked the question yeah. because i know in a captive situation a lone box turtle or whatever will mount and try and mate with a rock so if something has right. the form of a turtle but maybe that's where the chemical cues do come into play to determine species if the mm -hmm. turtle shape is there um but uh the investigation would result in you know same species mating instead of interspecies yeah yeah, it would be interesting to start remove peeling off like all the turtle features, <laughs> starting by the feet, the, the species specific features, and then the next see to which at which point like males start to like <laughs> this is no longer worth my time. Um, next up, we have uh, three five minute talks in a row. Um, the first talk is by Jenna Cantel, and it's about evaluating a new mitigation strategy to deter female turtles from nesting on unsafe road habitats. Go ahead, Jenna. Awesome. So thank you, Jackie. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jenna, and I'm a master's student in the Litskis, Litskis lab. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk to you about my research that is evaluating new mitigation strategies to deter female turtles from nesting in unsafe roadside habitats. Now this project takes place in Eastern Georgian Bay and it is in collaboration with Shawanaga First Nations in the Georgian Bay biosphere. So it's well known that roads are one of the greatest threats to turtle communities in Ontario. However, each year female turtles risk their fitness by nesting in exposed gravel on road shoulders. This attractive yet dangerous nesting habitat can have serious consequences for the viability of turtle populations. Here we will evaluate a mitigation strategy that addresses this concern. And the goal of this strategy is to deter females from nesting in unsafe roadside habitat and encourage their use of safer alternative sites. So the strategy makes use of routine road maintenance to upgrade uh, culverts to act as aquatic crossing structures and remove exposed gravel by replacing it with rock riprap and paved road shoulders as well as to construct artificial nesting mounds away from the road. So the installation of this strategy occurs over the course of three years, where in 2020, the culverts were upgraded, as well as post nesting season, the exposed gravel on road embankments was replaced with riprap. This past season in 2021, the road shoulders were paved to further remove any exposed gravel, as well as artificial nesting mounds will be constructed. And then by next field season in 2022, the entire uh, mitigation strategy will be in place for nesting season. So this leads to the question of, does the new strategy effectively reduce road threats for female turtles? And through the study, we will find out. Now, I'm still in the early stages of my master's, but I will briefly take you through my project objectives and a few observations I have so far. So my first objective is to describe the local turtle community ecology. And we will do this through a marker capture study, capturing turtles found on the road and in the wetlands adjacent to the road. So far after our first field season of turtle captures, we have 47 blendings, 96 painted turtles and 105 snapping turtles with a total of 248 new turtle captures in 2021. With this capture data, we will evaluate the impacts of the mitigation strategy in the context of the local turtle population. So this leads to my second objective where I'll answer the question of, does the strategy effectively deter females from nesting on roadsides? And we will answer this by conducting a before, during, after control impact study based on three years of road mortality and nesting survey data collected at both control and impact sites. So, so far uh, in the before period in 2020, 137 nests were recorded on road shoulders. In this past season, uh, during the during phase of the study, there were slightly fewer with 105 nests. However, as you can see in the photos to the right here, there was a lot of disturbance occurring on the road during this time, as this is when road resurfacing was happening, where in the bottom photo, you can see some turtles took full advantage of the entire road being basically a nesting pit. So in the after phase, when all the components are in place for nesting season, if the strategy is in fact successful, we expect to see a continued decrease in the amount of nests that are occurring on road shoulders, 
as well as the use of artificial nesting mounds. So we will also closely observe turtles' interactions with the riprap through behavioral trials with hatchlings, as well as with the use of wildlife cameras on site. We will categorize and score behaviors to quantify our observations using frequency distributions. And this information will hopefully help us to ensure that there are no secondary consequences occurring with replacing the gravel with the rock riprap. So overall, the strategy will be considered successful if it prevents females from nesting on the road shoulders and no secondary consequences are observed. We hope that the study can be used to inform best management practices during road maintenance for mitigating any harm to turtle populations near roads. I would just like to say a quick thank you to everyone who's involved in this project, especially to the amazing people who helped me this summer. And thank you for listening. Our next presenter is Stephanie DeLay. Um, she is going to be speaking about the impacts of a wind farm and subsequent wildfire on the spatial ecology and habitat selection of turtles. Thank you, Jackie. So today I'm going to be presenting the research that I'm conducting for my master's at Laurentian University under the supervision of Dr. Litskis and with a partnership with Blazing Star Environmental. So far we've conducted two field seasons but have yet to analyze our data so I'll be presenting our study design and highlighting the need for our study. But before I start, I wanna acknowledge the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and acknowledge that our research takes place on the traditional territory of the Atikamikshing and Anishinaabek. So wind energy centers are increasing at an unprecedented rate and understandably so as it provides clean renewable energy with low lifetime carbon emissions, a relatively low cost per megawatt hour, and an electricity generation efficiency that can be comparable to coal or gas. But there is a lot of research out there that tells us that wind farms can have negative impacts on wildlife. From habitat fragmentation, destruction and alteration, to the direct mortality of wildlife from turbines and roads, noise, vibration, shadows and turbulence caused by the turbines themselves that could be impacting wildlife, and an increased risk of wildfire occurrence on wind farms from the presence of machinery and turbines. Now these impacts on wind farms have been studied in various taxa, but turtles have largely been excluded from this research, even though they're one of the most at-risk groups on the planet. So our study aims to quantify the impacts of a wind farm and subsequent wildfire on the spatial ecology and habitat selection of an endangered freshwater turtle. To do this, we're going to use a post hoc design with three treatments, a control site, a wind farm site, and a wind farm site that has also been burned by a wildfire recently. Specifically, we're interested in determining and comparing home range size, daily distance moved, macro habitat selection, and micro habitat selection among treatments to see if we find a significant difference. To do this, we're going to outfit 10 turtles in each treatment with VHF radio transmitters, which will allow us to locate the same individuals twice per week throughout the active season. We are going to collect location data, environmental parameters, macro habitat type, and 15 micro habitat features at both the turtle location and a random paired location every time we locate these turtles. So once we've collected our data, we're going to calculate the minimum convex polygon home range size for each individual and compare it among treatments and reproductive classes using a two-way ANOVA. And we're going to uh, find the minimum daily distance move for each individual and compare it among treatments, reproductive classes, and seasons using a repeated measure ANOVA. For our macro habitat portion, we are going to consider selection at two scales. So the individual's home range and the population's home range. All of our available habitat is going to be classified using the ecological land classification system to try to offer greater applicability and transferability of our results to other wind farms with at-risk turtles. We are going to determine macro habitat selection using compositional analyses. So we're gonna pair available to used macro habitat types where selection will be inferred if there's disproportional use. And to compare it among treatments, we're gonna create a ranking matrix so that we can compare it qualitatively. For the microhabitat selection portion, we're gonna use paired logistic regressions where 15 habitat variables will be measured at both the turtle location and a random paired location. 
we're going to run a PCA and test for autocorrelation to see if any of those 15 variables need to be removed before proceeding. Then we're going to determine eight a priori models based on previously described turtle habitat selection. And we're going to run small sample AIC on each individual turtle's data to evaluate parsimony and fit. Then we're going to create a ranking matrix again to compare using either the sum of AICs or cumulative ranks. So our study is very important because it helps fill a significant gap in knowledge about how turtles are impacted by wind farms. Our results will also be able to help generate mitigation strategies for policymakers to use to ensure that turtles can thrive on a wind farm, even if it then catches on fire. So if you have any questions or comments about my study, I'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email or ask me during the question period. Thank you for your time. Merci. And we will move on to the final five minute presentation for this session by Hope Freeman. There's Hope, I see her. Um, she'll be speaking about multi-scale assessment of rock barrens, uh, turtle nesting habitat, effects of moisture and temperature on hatch success. So hello everyone, my name is Hope Freeman and I am a second year master's student within the McFaster Ecohydrology Lab and today we'll be discussing a multi-scale assessment of um, rock barrens turtle nesting habitat, effects of moisture and temperature on hatch success. And before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that the fact that this research was carried out in the Georgian Bay Biosphere, a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve situated within the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1923. And this research was conducted on Anishinaabeg territory. And today we'll also be presenting from Anishinaabeg territory. So our study region falls along the Rock Barrens landscape within beautiful Eastern Georgian Bay. This area is a biodiversity hotspot, which provides habitat for over 50 species at risk, including six of the eight native turtle species found within Ontario. Within this unique landscape, turtles will nest in shallow soil on rocky outcrops that are dominated by moss and lichen, like the one seen here on this slide. While the rock barrens must provide similar incubation conditions to other nesting habitat, such as beaches, to permit successful egg incubation, the shallow soils overlain on the gran granite bedrock are subject to highly variable temperature and moisture fluctuations. And really little is known about the unique soil, thermal and moisture regimes in rock barren nesting habitat and the effects on hatch success. And this lack of knowledge really limits our ability to predict climate change impacts on nesting habitat and hatch success, and then to further create suitable artificial nesting habitat that is characteristic of those natural rock barren sites. So that brings me to our research goal, which was to provide the first comprehensive multi-scale assessment of turtle nesting habitat in a rock barrens landscape. This figure here will re represent examples of the shallow soil deposits underlain by the bedrock. So here we have a crevice where the soil will accumulate in the cracks of the bedrock, a ledge where the soil will accumulate on the edge of the bedrock, and a flat where it accumulates on gently sloping um, bedrocks. At the nest site scale, we characterized nesting habitat and tested for evidence of nest site selection. We also conducted a landscape scale systematic survey to assess the availability of terminal nesting habitat. And finally, we examined the effects of nest temperature on, and moisture on egg hatching success. So I'd like to get started by discussing the effects of nest temperature on egg hatching success. So this figure here represents the mean hourly soil temperature at the top A and bottom B um, within the nest chamber. And this is during the 2018 and 2019 incubation period. The nests were laid in the crevice, flat, and ledge morphology. And we found that crevices lay, or nests laid in the crevice morphology were up to three degrees warmer than their counterparts during the evening and night, despite the nests being deeper in crevices. And because crevices have a more soiled granite contact, the heat from the bedrock can really prevent a drop in soil temperature at night, which would be a really critical process for maintaining incubation temperatures and minimizing those temperature fluctuations. And from there, I'd like to move on to the effects of moisture on egg hatching success. So this figure here represents rainfall during the 2018, which is this figure here, and 2019 incubation period, and the average 15 minute soil saturation in percent for the sections of the nest cavities with 100% um, hatch success, which is in this red color here, 
and 0% hatch success in the black there. So we found that nest sections with 100% hatch success drain quicker following rainfall and maintain drier conditions by an average of about 32% in the wetter season and about 5% in the drier season. And from this, we know that the moisture regime um, within a nest site is really strongly dependent on the nest site's ability to respond to water inputs because turtle eggs must be incubated in moist soils, but you don't want them to become flooded and oversaturated, but you also don't want them to dry out and be become desiccated. So they really have to sit in this happy medium. So what does that mean and why is this important? Well, our study showed that um, the shallow rock barrens has a unique soil and temperature dynamics, or sorry, soil temperature and moisture dynamics that are tightly coupled with soil properties and bedrock morphology to provide those successful egg incubation conditions. And furthermore, we found that in a relatively undisturbed rock barrens landscape, the nesting habitat was naturally limited. And therefore, if there was any altered effect to the function of this natural nesting habitat, it could severely affect these sensitive turtle populations. And therefore, we recommend that the key management strategies for this area should include stronger protection of these critical rock barren habitats and development of landscape appropriate strategies for restoration and creation of nesting habitat. So I'd just like to say thank you to the McMaster Ecologology Lab Group for their assistance in collecting the data for this project. Gracie Crofts for sharing her research on Indigenous fire keeping and land management and acknowledge that the fact that this research was carried out with the support of the Henry Inlet First Nations. Thank you very much for listening. So I think this question is for Hope from John Urquhart. Did you measure the aspect of the ledge, crevice, and flats? This likely has a differential impact on the ledge sites versus flats, for example. Yes, we did measure the aspect of the um, nest, like all of the sites, so the crevice, flat, and ledge. Um, we didn't find any like large differences. We are still working on this project to this day. And um, I'd say that on average, the aspect of the site was about 10 degrees or like the degree of the slope. And then depending on the aspect, north, south, east, or west, or straight up. But yeah, it was we didn't really see anything that was like stuck out to us, if that answers your question in terms of the differences. Good, John. Okay. I have another I have a question for Steph uh, I, um, from Gabrielle. I wonder if you should also consider a spatial eigenfunction analysis with variation partitioning to determine the contributions of space and the environment on habitat selection in the turtles. You are already considering autocorrelation. I feel like spatial eigenfunction analysis would be really helpful for really understanding the influence. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that suggestion. So we are considering a couple different ways to conduct our analyses to try to figure out how we can get our best results. So that's a really good suggestion. I'll definitely be looking into that. So thank you. No worries. Oh, um, going up to Jenna, there's a bunch of comments about Jenna's presentation up here I want to get to. I'm looking for Amanda's comment. There it is. Um, I wonder how much we could align turtle protection interests with road cycling interests. The local cycling community around here, Eastern Ontario, has been pushing for paved shoulders for years, but with limited success. Yeah, that's a fantastic comment. And I've definitely noticed on scary or the road that I survey, there's a lot of cyclists there every single day. So um, it would definitely be worth reaching out to and seeing if we can work together in that way. Tiana's already answered to say that would be a good idea too. So that's oh perfect. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm scrolling, scrolling. Question for Jenna. Will the nesting mounds be built near the roads where the turtles are, are used to nesting? Yeah, so it'll be in areas to try and intercept the turtles before they reach the riprap, but it will be relatively close to the roads so that they're heading that way anyways, and we hope to intercept them before they get to the road. Nice, thank you, okay. Um, I think that that's all the questions I have in the chat. Oh, it looks like Barbara has her hand up. Go ahead, Barb. 
Hi, thanks, Jackie. Uh, I also have a question for Jenna, and it's because I've been looking at riprap as the bane of herp's existence for a while now. Um, so I am kind of curious. I think the paving idea would be a way better solution for, for the reasons already brought up, um, but also because maybe other species that are crossing the road might not like the riprap. Um, solution but then also but but on the other hand if the if the turtles are a priority maybe that works cheapest and quickest and is best um, but I also want to raise the issue I did a treatment where I tried to cover rip wrap and compare um, the frequency of animals moving across it I'm going to talk a bit about that tomorrow and I met the difficulty of detectability it was way easier to see animals on unrip wrapped surfaces than on rip wrap. So I'm just wondering if that would be an issue you might have to deal with. Uh, yeah, so I have been looking pretty closely at the rip wrap when I'm out doing surveys on the road. And it's definitely tricky uh, seeing any species that might be in and underneath the rip wrap. But that is why we're going to try and do some behavioral trials outside of the road to see if there's any detectability issues that we wouldn't be able to see when we're out there. So it's, it's definitely something that I'm trying to consider with the project and that we're working on. That's great, thanks.